uh, who am I is a question that all of us uh, can ask. It's a question of personal identity. And in, in philosophical and, and psychological thinking about this question, many dimensions of the mind have been brought to bear. So people have thought memories, your biographical memories are part of who you are. They've thought your narratives that you construct about your life are part of who you are. Your sense of agency or control has been emphasized within the Kantian tradition and others. Identity is sometimes related to cognitive and perceptual capacities that we have. Uh, sometimes, maybe more obviously, even to personality. Um, but one dimension that's been relatively neglected, though not by folks in this room, is the relationship between identity and morality. So who I am is partially a function of what values I endorse. So in this project, we're going to be exploring that relationship between morality and identity. And uh, in doing this, we're, we're uh, trying to make a claim that morality is part of personal identity. It's part of what makes me me. Uh, now, within the history of Western thought, people like Aristotle have tried to develop theories of morality that relate to the self uh, in a synchronic sense. So who I am right now, the things that make me me at this moment, have to do with, among other things, my, my moral values. But within the Aristotelian tradition, with the focus on, on the, the development of virtue, it's sometimes it, uh, presented in a way that implies that some people have a moral identity and others don't. And in contemporary psychology, if you think about things like the Blasi tradition, where people have developed scales for, for looking at the degree of moral identification, it's seen as something that only some people attain or people attain to different degrees. We're interested in the idea that everyone or, or most typically developing people have a moral self. And the moral self can include virtuous character traits that we aspire to have but might also include principles and rules. So this dichotomization of a rule-based morality and a virtue-based morality we think isn't really the right way of looking at it. That Even if you have a set of rules you try to live by, those get integrated in the self in a way that makes them more like part of our identity. Um, and the rules that we have are not going to be universal. So we get a little nervous around uh, positions that list the virtues simply because the list that people come up with will differ across cultural conditions and traditions. So uh, we're not trying to identify an, a universal moral self, but rather a variable one. And that's important to our project. Uh, I made uh, Aristotle frown because he, he, uh, he didn't like those little amendments. Uh, di diachronic approaches to identity are associated with John Locke, among others, this thing, what makes me the same person over time. And this has really been, I think, neglected within discussions of how morality relates to the self, and it's very important to our project. So we think what makes me continuous from one moment to the, the next includes many, many psychological features, but we think morality is an important one of them. And indeed, we're going to try to argue that it's more important than other traits that we, uh, we might have that have been identified in the literature. And another important thing is if you look at philosophical theories of personal identity over time, the most typical theories are like the agency theory associated with Kant and Christine Korsgaard, memory theories coming out of the Lockean tradition associated with people like, like Derek Parfit, narrative theories that have been developed uh, by people like Alistair McIntyre or Mario Schechman. They're all individualistic. They're all traits that I have as a person that only tangentially make connections to others. But we think that moral identity is fundamentally group-based, and, and that's going to make Locke sad. Um, okay. I'm going to give you a little taste of what we've done so far and what we're doing now. This is a, a research group that's really uh, been underway and in conjunction with developing proposal for this project, we've already begun to pilot a lot of things that will become sources of information as we construct the project research. Um, but uh, uh, recently, Sean Nichols and I, who couldn't be here today, uh, did an experimental philosophy study where we asked people to imagine a case where you're walking through the mountains you sustain a head injury and you lose one of your faculties. And the faculty might be your memories of the past or it might be your moral uh, values. And the question is, to what extent would you be the same person after losing memory or losing morality or lo losing a number of other things we looked at? And really quite strikingly, as we predicted, but going against the literature, we found that loss of identity was much more keenly felt with loss of morality. If you lose your values, you're really not the same person as compared to memory, which was towards the top of our scale, suggesting that people really do think that you're the same person after losing memory. You're not exactly the same person, but to a much greater degree. And then uh, Nina Strominger, who's, who's on the committee, and Sean did a magnificent paper with five studies uh, published in Cognition, um, where they looked at this through a lot of different variations. So in one of their scenarios, they say, imagine taking a pill that uh, eliminates one of your capacities, 
or imagine that a friend has done this, uh, what, what would be the impact on their identity? And as compared to perceptual faculties, desires, memories, it's really morality that is the greatest insult to self. So we have a lot of data looking at this with, with um, Javier. We just piloted something where we asked people, is the loss of self metaphorical or literal? And in the memory case, overwhelmingly people say, you're only metaphorically not the same self. But with moral change, they say you're literally not the same person. So, uh, and we've been looking at this not just with these abstract categories like your moral values uh, are eliminated, but looking at much more um, applied things in the real world, like what about your religious values? What about your political values? And there are all these dimensions of human life, like occupation, uh, what kind of taste you have, where you live, that people identify with. But we ask, if you lose these, would you be the same person? If your job changes, if you move from America to Europe, does your identity change? The only ones that brought people sort of on lower points below the midpoint on our scale were loss of religion and politics, or two moral dimensions. So very, very robust set of findings, but tons of questions remain unanswered. And this project is about making progress on these other questions. Relationship between personal identity and group identity, uh, relationship between moral self and responsibility, individual differences in this construct, how it's implemented in the mind-brain, whether there's a difference between our implicit and our explicit moral values, and of course, how this all impacts behavior. So our project is divided into two years, first looking at the first collection of questions with hatch, which have to do with how people conceptualize their moral identity, and then a uh, year on mechanisms and behavior. So um, I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna try and just briefly summarize those research projects. Uh, all of these are very um, uh, kind of quick summaries of uh, what we're looking at and what we've been looking at in the pilot work. So on responsibility, some of the work we've been doing, so this is again with, with ha Javier uh, Gomez-Lavin, we've been looking at how people um, attribute responsibility in cases of somebody who's in prison who undergoes a transformation. That could be a loss in memory, it could be a change in values, and what we find is that people uh, think that somebody who's lost their memory um, should still be punished to the maximum degree. They shouldn't get early parole. But change in values is considered relevant in making parole decisions. There's a little typo here, but in, an, in a, another a conceptual replication of this study, uh, we show that people judge that somebody who's lost their moral values uh, should be paroled and doesn't, need, doesn't deserve to be stayed, uh, uh, stuck in prison, whereas memory changes and, and potentially other changes uh, uh, do um, uh, suggest that punishment should continue. So uh, we're looking in, in future directions. Uh, corruption versus reform, is there an asymmetry there? Are people get worse versus better? Is that a different impact on the self? We've found in some pilot work suggestive evidence that there's a difference between attitudes of reward versus punishment after moral transformation, so we're beginning to look at that. Uh, one of the areas I'm most interested in is, is social signaling. So how do you tell others about your moral identity? Do you come around with a kind of business card that says, you know, I'm a lefty? No, so you probably can all guess my politics. And the reason you can do that is I'm doing this signaling thing here by looking a little bit unconventional. So uh, if you had to guess which one is the conservative and which one is the liberal, it's, it's trivial. And I, I know you won't be able to read this slide, but so we've just been collecting survey data looking at the things that people use to guess politics. So if, you, if you're into NASCAR races, conservative or liberal? If you're into uh, hip hop, conservative or liberal? So, and so you can just do this quite systematically. Of course, they're stereotypes, but people are able to infer. So it's all these other dimensions of the self, things having to do with taste, actually have a moral meaning. So we project morality into these other domains. So we're looking at that uh, potentially as sources of, of bias and in-group preference. Uh, we're also looking, beginning to look at phenomena of self-sacrifice for the group. If the self is fundamentally social, then signaling your membership in a group also means you've created a kind of familial or virtual kinship relationship where your willingness to sacrifice for that group becomes, uh, becomes exaggerated. Um, we're looking at individual variation in the moral self. So uh, Nina Strominger with, with uh, Sean has done some really exciting work looking at different psychiatric dimensions. So if you administer a psychopathy scale, you can show that psychopaths who are famously uh, deprived of a full comprehension of the moral domain uh, show tendencies to be less sensitive to moral dimensions of the self than others. And in fact, looking at the psychopathy scale, the higher ratings of psychopathy lead to less sensitivity to the moral self. Um, Nina has also looked 
at how individuals who have family members or loved ones who have undergone various psychiatric um, uh, changes due to, due to illness um, are regarded. Are your friends who have become depressed or your friends who have undergone a, a, a brain injury that's led to a, a deficit in memory or in, in language skills, are they the same person? And it's really only the moral changes in our friends that gets people worried about uh, identity. Uh, so we're going to look at a number of clinical populations using this kind of work. We're also looking at comparative work both cross-culturally and different professional groups. We're looking at real-world changes um, in people's personalities like moral injury and religious conversion. And this very briefly in the, in the second year, we're starting to, to really try to get at the underlying mechanism. So um, one of the aspects that we're interested in is the notion of a vowel. So uh, suppose I, I have a sort of uh, reaction that's inculcated in me because of my cultural background, but I no longer endorse it. So suppose I'm raised in a homophobic society and I find myself having these uh, involuntary reactions to people who are openly gay or to public displays of affection between people who are, are gay. Um, but I don't want to have those. It's like implicit racism. People who score racist on an IAT, which is pretty much everyone, might uh, not want to have those reactions. So is that part of the self? Are the implicit or involuntary aspects of moral responsiveness part of the self? So we've just begun to pilot this. In fact, we were doing some of this work just in the last couple of days. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that there's a difference in the traits you avow and the traits that you disavow. And we think that might be an important contribution to theories of identification. So people like Harry Frankfurt in philosophy and many in psychology have wondered what is it to identify with a trait. And we think the moral self work will help us uh, answer those questions. Um, so um, there are a number of things people do that are kind of nasty. We're selfish. We're, we're hypocritical. There are wonderful research programs looking at moral hypocrisy. We're intolerant and biased in various ways. And we think that priming or raising salience of moral aspects of identification, a kind of self-labeling paradigm, might lead to a reduction in, in these negative aspects of, of behavior. So it's a kind of intervention through self-labeling. Um, in a fifth uh, a line of work, we're going to be looking at underlying mechanisms. One thing that uh, we have hypothesized is that attribution of identity in the context of moral traits might be more automatic than other, certain other dimensions of identity. That's a cognitive dimension. With respect to emotion, we think it might be affectively mediated, which is to say, uh, suppose somebody tells you that uh, a friend has undergone a major change, they've lost their memories. That might be upsetting, uh, but not to the same degree or in the same way as hearing that they've undergone a moral transformation. So uh, you, none, no one wants to be friends with members of the other political party. There's wonderful work by people like Linda Skitka that you actually don't even want to sit close to somebody if you know that they're a Republican and you're not. Um, so if you just ask the person next to you, like, What's, what are your politics, and you discovered you don't like them, you're not going to sit next to that person after the next talk. You know, it's, so, um, but we're, so we think there's an emotional dimension there. Um, in, in terms of measurement, we're looking at uh, uh, things like reaction times to study automaticity and attributions of morality um, as a dimension of self, and also cognitive load. So Javier uh, Gomez-Lavin comes from a working memory lab, and, and that training uh, has opened up possibilities of, of testing the impact and giving people cognitively demanding tasks while asking them about identity. We expect more interference for things like memory constructs than uh, moral constructs. I keep coming back to memory, but we're actually looking at a large family of dimensions of selfhood uh, as contrast case with a moral case. With respect to emotion, you can show, as in this just this thought experiment we did, that there's more arousal for moral transformation than other forms of transformation, and you can also manipulate emotion. So both Nina and I have done a lot of work using emotion induction paradigms to show impact on dimensions of moral judgment. And of course, those who know the moral psychology literature know there's a huge literature on emotion and moral judgment, but not that much on emotion and um, and identity. So we're sort of bringing those research traditions together. Our final thing, very quickly, uh, there's a lot to say about this. There's a, a very big, interesting body of work that we're building on about moral, moral identity and pro-social behavior. Uh, but we're taking that in some new directions, sometimes building on work that exists out there, building in some cases on work that's been done in the lab, in our research group. So Sean Nichols conducted a study about future giving, and he found that if you think you're going to change dramatically over time, or if you're induced to think that, they also do an induction of manipulation in their, in their study, 
you're inclined to give more to your future self than if you think you're going to remain constant. And uh, so we're looking at a, a um, variation of this. Instead of just talking about psychological connectedness across the board, we're going to look at moral connectedness and try and show that if you think you're going to be very morally connected to yourself in the future, you're going to give nothing. You're going to give less to yourself. If you think you're going to be very morally different, you're going to give more because you're worried about that moral change. So finally, looking forward, we think morality is central to identity, crucial for responsibility, automatic and emotional, constrained by avowal, fundamentally social, and crucial for real world behavior. We're a team that have psychologists and philosophers working together. We've done a lot of work on this. We have pioneers of experimental philosophy in the team. We've done the, the initial experiments on this particular construct. We've all worked together. We've all co-authored papers together. And uh, we're deploying a wide range of uh, methods. Every one of us have done studies that go beyond paper and pencil methods. When we saw that in the call for uh, proposals, we were extremely excited. But we were especially excited that this is a proposal um, connected to research that we already had underway that fits right in with the, what the project is all about. So when we saw these people proposing a, a broad project on morality and identity, we thought, wow, this is just what we want to be doing. So we, you know, Aristotle in the lab coat, studying moral identity, kind of our dream. Uh, sorry for this weird picture of hell. It's the only picture of Sean Nichols I had. He's, he's <laughs> that guy up there. But uh, we were a little mad at him for not being here, though he really did want to come. So thank you all very much. Oh yeah, those are great set of studies. Very interesting. Um, and it makes me wonder whether you've ever thought about turning this question about uh, how much would you lose yourself if you lost your morality into a measure of uh, moral centrality to identity, right? Say as a computer to the Blasi measure or something like that. Sure. And then using that to then predict moral behaviors of individuals and you know, other kinds of personality traits and so on, things like that. It seems like that would fit really well with the goals of the project because they're looking for alternative measures of, of moral identity. I, I love that. That's a, that's a super suggestion, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, quite, it's not quite an implicit measure, but it's a less direct measure than the centrality questions in the Blasius scale. Right. So uh, if we could show a connection between that and behavior, it would really strengthen the Blasius results. Howard. Mechanism, Jesse? <laughs> Can you say something about what you're thinking about mechanism? Yeah, and I should also invite if any if any team wants to say anything. You know, I there are different ways to think about what we what's going on in mechanism. At our, our current stage, we have a bunch of questionnaire results. And we want to know what's going on both when people attribute this stuff to others and when they make decisions based on this aspect of, of themselves. And so at, at a very first pathway, mechanism really means nothing more than sort of what's, what's in their head when they do this. So you say, what's the mechanism behind moral judgment? And you say, well, let's look at, say, uh, affective states that occur when people make these judgments and manipulate those, push those around, and see that affects the, the verbal presentation of that judgment. We're, we're thinking about that in a similar way. Um, with respect to things like automaticity, the more cognitive aspects of this, you know, one, one line of thought is if you give people load, um, and it's not interfering with this effect, we get the, res the null result as compared to, to some other dimension of the cell, it would suggest a construct that philosophers and psychologists have systematically ignored, again, with the exception of everyone here, uh, to say that ordinary folks immediately have access to this dimension of identity, that's part of the ordinary, automatic, very knee-jerk, cult conception of the cell, yet we've all missed it, would be a kind of wake-up call to all of us, but it would also tell us something about its, its strength in, uh, in decision making. When, when Linda Skitka looked at different measures of attitude strengths, looking at, at centrality and, and importance um, and, and all the others, she found, she found that only morality scored as high an attitude strength for all of these. They become dissociated for other dimensions like taste. And uh, so we're, we're trying to see whether that centrality is present in a form of immediacy of access in a way that could ultimately have implications for behavior. Darsha? In light of the discussions we've been having here, um, I'm, uh, my, I'm struck by what I think you're uh, focusing on is that kind of ego self, the kind of Western focused self. And I was wondering if you had thought about 
looking at the other deeper self, the common self, the no self kind of thing, and priming for that, and then seeing what happens. Because I, I would predict that people who have that more common self orientation would not be shifting um, because they have a sense that the self is pretty constant, that common self is that everyone else, the individual selves are connected to, right? Do you know what so, I mean? Yeah, yeah um, Sean and I actually have data on, maybe not exactly that, but um, Buddhists, we're comparing Buddhists and Hindus and Western subjects. We actually um, haven't found very good evidence for that. Um, uh, in fact, <laughs> we have the counterintuitive result that uh, we went out to Tibet, India, that uh, Buddhists are in some ways uh, more selfish, um, less giving, uh, more sort of um, self-oriented than, um, than others. Uh, oh, uh, well, for example, giving to other people. So if, um, if you have to sort of give up your medicine in the future to someone else in the future, uh, Buddhists actually are far, far less willing to give up their medicine to other people uh, compared with Hindus and, and Americans. Uh, at, which is uh, in stark contrast to their explicit um, proclamation. So if you ask them, are you the same person that you'll be at this time when you would be giving the medicine away? They say, oh no, I'll be completely different. So there's this weird sort of disconnect between the explicit commitments and the actual implicit um, um, processes, it, it seems, uh, between, um, between the two. So what, I mean, one of our, our broad interests in this is to not assume how it's gonna work out in different cultural groups form hypotheses, and the best moments in science are when your hypothesis gets refuted and you, you learn something unexpected, and usually there's a deeper story there, so it becomes an impetus for future work. You know, I, I, I just started setting up a research group in Moscow, and I, when I talk to them about some of these ideas, they say, well, you know, we don't have this kind of fixed party affiliation, and for Europeans in the room, you know that many places, this idea that you're just always going to vote Democrat seems sort of odd, and so ways in which people's moral identity get constructed across religious context and political and cultural context is one of our central interests in moving forward, and we hope to be frequently surprised. I think Walter has a, you're Walter, aren't you? Yes. Good. Walter has a question. Hi, great presentation, thank you. I had a quick question. Um, was like directionality of how they changed. Were they less moral or they become more moral, moral and does that change the effects? Um, to, are we looking at a baseline where there's no? We've done it, bo We've done it both ways. Okay. Um, and we find that, um, so whether it's a change for the better or change for the worse, so uh, becoming more moral or less moral or even losing the moral faculty altogether, um, you find the same pattern of results um, there's, uh, it ha we haven't done any systematic I uh, investigations as to which is more powerful, right? Becoming better or becoming worse. And there might be, for instance, negativity dominance or something else going on there. But if you compare sort of positive moral change to negative moral change, that still is more essential to identity than losing your memories or other sorts of psychological changes you can undergo. Yeah. Sean, if I, uh, Sean and I, too, have looked at both positive and negative moral change and degree of agency in moral change. Because when we first started thinking about it, people started saying to us, well, if you choose to change your values, it's clearly still you. And we found just the opposite. In fact, the numbers are indistinguishable. And in a couple of our studies, they were numerically the same. The means, just by coincidence, came out numerically the same as uh, moral changes that are accidental caused by brain injury or other, other stories that we gave, uh, psychiatric uh, uh, loss. So I, I think what we're finding with this is that it's so robust that valence and, and agency are just not able to move it as much as we would have expected. We have two more questions. Charlie? All right, um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I, I've got a question. I might have missed something on the, on the screens, but when, you, when you're talking about the moral self, are you, t um, at one point you mentioned values, so are you connecting that to the moral self being constituted by the values we have or a, spe a special set of values? For, for instance, do any of the studies um, uh, differentiate between what we might call moral values and other very s closely held values that would be intuitively close to the self, let's say uh, ho hobbies, um, habits, friendships, which may or may not be moral, but they could be very constitutive of, of who we are. I'd, I'd like to hear a bit about that. Okay, I mean, we, we, did, we did get quite interested in this, and we actually expected certain things like professional affiliations, which I mentioned, but some that I didn't read out loud, but we did look at hobbies, 
Um, and we haven't looked at friendship, which is a super idea. People's personal ties, and those break. You know, people talk about marriage, for instance, or loss of a child being a major life change that could be thought of in self-related terminology. Our, our working hypothesis is that morality is very important. If other things work out to be as important, that, then we're learning something, and we'll be excited by that. What we're finding, often to our surprise, is that morality so dwarfs these other effects that, uh, and that we even suspect that when we see some movement in one of these other dimensions, it might be because it in some way connects to or recapitulates the moral dimension. So we don't, it's not our, our interest to refute other views about what's important to identity. It's to identify one that is important, but it does, it does look like it, it works out to be more important. So this is not the best methodology because we listed hobbies and they're not really popular ones, but I didn't explain this data slide. These are people who gave very, very high ratings of endorsement or interest in the particular things on the bottom of the slide. So if you, and it works no matter how you do the data, but if you do the data analysis, just looking at the people who say, I'm super into music, for example, and then you say, well, what if your musical taste totally changed? They say, oh, I'm still the same person. Um, so I, my suspicion is we will hit some other things that, that look robust the way morality does, but we haven't hit them yet. And I just wanted to add, uh, the idea about the endorsement studies is also to see whether endorsement avowal or disavowal has to play a role in which are the most salient values, moral or non-moral, for the self. So that's something that we're planning on also expanding and um, testing, especially with Sean. We're going to do some like causal modeling on that as well. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention when we showed that slide with all of the uh, arrows going in that that's actually done with, with causal modeling, with structural equation modeling. So both in terms of the design and the, the methodology, but also the analyses, we're trying to implement a variety of methods. Sorry, but we're out of time, so maybe you can.